I do want to uh, thank our pastors for lending the stage just for the evening. Thank you guys very much. Uh, do you appreciate Pastor Bill and Sandy? What a fun. It's a little nerve-wracking. He's sitting over there, kind of. He's going to evaluate. I'm going to hear about the good. Uh, I'll hear about the bad after this. It'll be, I can't wait for that. But, but this is wild. Um, my wife, Molly, and I have been poured into in this house. I've been here for 19 years now. And it really, it really is crazy. I lived with my parents who were here, just drove the kids up. They watched all of our kids for eight days and then drove them up, got in town at like 5.50. We're like, we're going to church. So here we are. Uh, little Blakely's in the house. My wife, Molly, thank you guys for being here. All your marriage, everything. But, but how about like you live at home for 18 years? Some of you longer, some of you still there, 35, 36 years. It's very common. Millennials are just making it really cool to do that, okay? So great. But, but then it's fun to think about being at your church. Some of y'all have been here since day one. But, but it, it's an honor to be able to, to stand on this stage that genuinely, week in and week out, for almost two decades, has impacted our lives. And we really are forever grateful. So thanks for, thank you. Um, just kind of wild life. Like there's a lot going on. Everybody's got stuff. Everybody's doing a hundred different things all day, every day, and trying to do them all at once and, and trying to be great. And so tonight, just for a few minutes, I thought it'd be interesting just to kind of inspect maybe three things. Tonight, I was, um, I was on a plane uh, coming back, I think, from China. Real big planes, these big jumbo jets, and it, it's kind of wild. Hundreds of people in the air. It doesn't make sense. Boats and airplanes don't make sense. Cameras, I don't understand either. How do you capture all? Okay, so... Somebody explain it, but, but we're on this plane, and I'm looking at another plane, and the guy's doing his job and bringing people in, and it's this humongous plane with hundreds of people, and it, it pulls up and stops, and they put this tiny little wedge under the tire, and now this beast of a machine can no longer move, and I just, I, it just, just hit me. Maybe that doesn't fascinate anybody else. But this huge machine that's built to fly is now stopped by this tiny little wedge. And I just, I just wonder sometimes, like, is, could there be something in your life that's that small that actually might be preventing you from doing everything that God wants you to do? And so sometimes it's just, it's just healthy to have people in your lives, and we're going to go there a little bit tonight, but, but to actually inspect a few areas to look at what we could potentially do to remove a little piece of that wedge so that you can actually take off and, and you can take the people with you that you're supposed to take and do everything that God put in you to do. So that's kind of where we're going to go tonight. And the, the three areas, nothing crazy, but who's watching, who's running, and who's following. Who's watching, I think, it's interesting, there's people that are always watching us and we don't realize it, like sociologists will say that the most introverted person in the world will influence at least 10,000 people over the course of their life. So all the, all the introverts in here, man, it, it, it's, it, sometimes you, you think people don't see you. And I think it's funny, like if you've ever been by yourself in public and you just assume that because you're by yourself, other people don't notice you. Have you ever done this? We were in, uh, in Calgary this last weekend uh, with my beautiful wife, Molly, had a, had a fun time on behalf of World Compassion, spoke at a church and it did some stuff. But on one of the days... We were just kind of taking in the city. And you notice people that don't think you're watching them. People are readjusting. People are scratching. People are picking. All the stuff that people do when they don't think you're being watched. And so we're kind of taking the people in. And then all of a sudden we were like, man, we need to cross this road here. And so we start to go across the road. And it wasn't at the exact location that is specified to cross the road at. And so about halfway through, my very black and white wife starts yelling, I feel like this is illegal, which it was. It's jaywalking in another country. Okay, that's what we were doing. And so she's yelling. She goes, this is illegal. This is illegal. And then for whatever reason, maybe because she was trying to talk and walk, one foot got stuck. She almost caught herself. Almost caught, Three different times I thought, oh, she's going to save it. And I was so intrigued by her potentially saving it, I didn't help her. And she just stopped. No. No, and then did a complete layout in the middle of the road and just like as extended as her body could be. And then we realized the road that we're in is where the cable cars cross. 
And so all of a sudden, ding, 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 and one of them starts firing up, and it's going to come. And so Molly, as desperate as you've ever looked, just like re gently reached her hand up. And I, I wanted to help her, but I, I couldn't breathe. I, I just I wanted to save her so bad, but I, my ribs hurt because it was such an epic fall. And she's typically so athletic, like when we ride bikes or all that. You know, it's, it's amazing. Another, another story there. But I just grabbed her, and I, I picked her up, and, and I, I started praying and got real spiritual. And we got to this side, and this was her question. She goes, I wonder if anybody saw that. I'm like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Hundreds of people in this community of 1.5 million just saw that. And she's like, I wonder if somebody recorded it. So we've been, we've been looking. We've been look for the hashtag, falling America, whatever. We go, I don't know what it is, but if you find it, we want to watch it. But it's interesting because it's like, man, who's watching? I wonder if somebody saw that. And, and we, we know if you have kids, if you're an adult, man, your kids are watching. They say things you don't want them to say. They repeat things you don't want to repeat. We were with a family the other night, and he said they were watching Sandlot because it's 4th of July. He's got a little three-year-old son, and it's the part where the beast gets out, and Benny the Jet says a cuss word. And he goes, oh, S word. And so the dad, knowing it was coming, yelled pirate ship <laughs> to try to fill it in, right? And so now, apparently the kid walks around just saying, oh, ship, like all the time. Oh, you know, so... Kids are watching. People are watching. And I, wanted to, I want to show you this. Some of you guys saw this, and I did not know that we had a very significant coach in the house. But I want to show you a clip from another team just real quick. So if you've got the clip, let's just play it right quick. This is from the beloved Dallas Cowboys. Dak Prescott throws, not very athletic, misses, doesn't know the camera's on him, and throws it in the trash can. No Cowboys fan, no no integrity filled people, no. Okay, I got totally, totally. Feel you. However, let's look at the principle here, okay? Doesn't know he's on camera. Empty Gatorade cup, toss it. You guys probably saw this a couple years ago. I thought it was, I actually saw it happen live, and I thought, oh, he missed. And I was like, he's actually gonna go get it. Didn't know that people were watching. They actually, the next day, all these different, uh, Sports commentators, stuff like that, are talking about the integrity of this young man and this whole thing. But we don't know when people are watching. And I want you to know the world is watching us. What are you going to do with it? I know we have, I know we have Instagram. I know it, it's easy for people to commentate and say negative things about you behind a screen. I'm just telling you, we can't let that affect who we are and what we're supposed to be doing because people are watching. I believe it, it's fun. We talk about this in, in youth all the time, and it's I almost got emotional. Sable's up here singing like just belting. And, and Corey's over there. And, and bro, I mean, just all these people that make this whole thing work, former youth kids just loving Jesus to this day. It's amazing. But we say a lot of times, everybody's looking for somebody to follow. Let's just be that. So many people confused about life and trying to figure out what steps to take. And the reality is we get to be it. Jason and I were in Iraq recently and just kind of the whole concept is wild the idea this idea of the world is watching isis comes in and does terrible things in the in the name of the quran representing everything that is islam in the extreme version and they do all this stuff and then these people are just left desolate and hurting and the muslim community didn't really rally but what happened is a lot of christian organizations and, and Christian people actually started coming in trying to pick up the pieces. And so now all of a sudden, what's this unbelievable tragedy and still is in a lot of places, but now Christians actually kind of stepped up and started coming in and showing love and support and, and helping and bringing in food and visiting in camps. And so in a lot of the conversations that we have, it's interesting because they were watching. And as wild as ISIS was and, and, and terrible, after all that, Christians actually started coming in. And so their words were, our own people didn't help us respond, Christians did. So now for the first time in centuries, there's this little window of opportunity because they were watching and they liked what they saw. When I first got saved, I was trying to figure a lot of stuff out and before I started coming to the church here. and My granddad, who kind of a salty old guy, 
I just got saved. I'm all excited about it. And he said something that, that really has impacted a lot of decisions. He simply said, if the Jesus stuff is real, why wouldn't everybody want it? If it's all real, if everything the Bible says is true, why wouldn't the whole world want to be a Christian? So I'm thinking about it. And he said, I, I believe it just hasn't been packaged correctly. So to kind of throw this out there to you, we understand the world's watching, but the real question is, how are you, how are we packaging this life of Christ in a way that's appealing to them? How are we living our lives? How are we communicating? How are we helping? How are we serving? How are we being the church? Because we've got to package it correctly. Let me show you a verse. Turn to Matthew 5, 14. This is in the uh, Passion Translation. Verse 14 says, your lives light up the world. Let others see your light from a distance, for how can you hide a city that stands on a hilltop? And who could light a lamp and then hide it in an obscure place? Instead, it's a place where everyone in the house can benefit from the light. Man, what if we just thought through that lens? We're sitting here singing, man, your kingdom come, your will be done. What if it really happens? That's what we get to live out. That, that's the goal here. But it's, it's, it's a result of being the light and what we do benefiting. The light's a benefit. We get to be a benefit. So don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before others so the commendable things you do will shine as light upon them. And then they will give their praise to your Father in heaven. So I come back around on that. Man, how are we packaging this gospel? My challenge, I think, just in this little part would just be, are there, are there people that you're aware of, just, just maybe as we're talking a little bit, that, that you're thinking about that you know need to see the gospel packaged in a way that relates to them? And I know it's, only, it's almost become cliche to say, but the reality is there really are people that only you can reach. It's how you're designed. It's how you're wired. It's the experiences that you've had. Those wild things that you had to go through and you had to navigate have put you in a position to reach specific people. So I just throw that out there, man. Who, who maybe as we talk tonight is God going to put on your heart? And all he's saying is, I just need you to open your mouth. I will do the rest. The Holy Spirit will convict. The Holy Spirit will help lead and guide that conversation. But be sensitive tonight to be thinking, man, who and how am I packaging this unbelievable life-changing gospel? We're all in here tonight because it changed our lives. And if you need a refresh or a restart on that, we'll absolutely take care of that every time these doors are open. But let's think about who are we packaging this for? How are we communicating this unbelievable message? Number two, who's running? Number one, who's watching? Number two, who's running? And so the question here is, are you running? And then the, the immediate follow-up is, who's running with you? Hebrews 12.1. As for us, we all have these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. We must let go of every wound. A lot of the New King James says we, this is where we lay down the weight that, that slows us down. Look at this translation. It says, we must let go of every wound that has pierced us. And in the Aramaic, it actually refers to that being like an arrow tip that gets stuck in us. Obviously, we're not going to be able to run at our best. We're not going to be able to optimize our performance if we've got a running injury nagging us and keeping up with us. It's going to be the weight that slows us down, the sin that easily we fall into. Because if we can let go of that, then we'll be able to run life's marathon. Another translation says obstacle course with passion and determination. For the path has been already marked out before us. Or in other words, the mark is personally appointed. Your path, the path that you're supposed to be running on is personally and intricately appointed for you. And how cool is that? So to do that, though, we've got to recognize that we might have a little bit of weight or a little bit of hurt or a little bit of, little bit of bitterness, a little bit of what's slowing you down? What, what for you personally might be that little tip of the arrowhead that's stuck in you? kind of like that wedge. What do we need to remove so you can run? Wounds and sin are what keep us from running. 
It's a lengthy race, but we've already been forewarned that there's going to be some complications and some difficulties. And Pastor Bill preached a great message a couple of weeks ago. The, the storm hit the guy that was built on the rock, and it hit the guy built on the sand. Both of them got sh shook. Both of them got routed a little bit. Both of them had to navigate the storm. We're all, we're all huddled around our toilets during the tornado, and it's like, okay, we, we did have to do that. And then we're all sitting in here tonight, and it's all good like it never happened. We had to navigate it. But now, look at what we're capable of communicating that we've been through. But we've got to be able to run. So, so as you run, who else is headed that same direction? One of the greatest lessons I've ever learned at this church is no matter what you're doing, you've got to build a great team. Man, we're going we're gonna to clean up the parking lot. Perfect. Who's going out to help us clean up the parking lot? Man, we're going to put on the nightmare. We're, we're going to give away a million bikes. We're gonna, whatever it is, we're going to give out groceries every single Friday. Let's build a great team. So every little thing, every single time drive, God drops something in your heart. Man, here's a, here's a fresh idea. Man, here's a new direction to go. The first question we ask, man, who am I going to grab to accelerate and streamline what God's called me to do? What if we just train ourselves? That's the first question I'm going to ask. God, I feel like you're doing something. God, I feel like there's a little bit of a stir. And God, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like you've got a, a new and a fresh plan. God, I'm, I'm feeling excited, man. Man, who's the, who's the first person? Who are the people that I'm going to ask, that I'm going to grab, that I'm going to lock arms with? Because I'm just telling you, if, if, if the Christianity side of this is new, the most important thing you can do is lock arms with the right people. And then I'll say this. If you've been doing this a while, pretty salty, pretty great Christian, the most important thing you can do is lock arms with the right people. That's it. I, I, Molly and I would not be happy. We wouldn't be filled. I, I'm just telling you, if we didn't have the amazing people that we have in our lives. And the, the cool thing is, it's kind of this built-in, unbelievable cheering section. And, and so what happens is this, this supernatural confidence that comes from God and then starts coming from the people around us to where it's like, man, I've got this crazy idea, and you go for it, and it fails, and you've got unbelievable people around you to pick you up, giggle about it, and try again. Or it's a wild success, and all these people are right there to celebrate and cheer you on. Man, either way, you become unstoppable. Man, are you running? Have you, have you removed the, the little wounds and the, the sin that just might be holding you back? So are you running? And then who are you running with? I'm not, I'm not officially like a gangster, officially. We used to giggle about it as kids and say we were from Compton and just kind of make stuff up just because it was kind of fun at the time, Snoop, Doggy Dog, and those kind of people and all this stuff. But, but the, there's something about kind of that gang mentality where you cannot mess with somebody wearing that color without having to get the load from everybody else. And I kind of think we need to get a little bit better at that as Christians. And I understand there's a lot of, lot of differences. I understand there's a lot of different opinions and, and translations and all. I get it. But, man, you're a Christian. It's one of the first things I remember Pastor Bill preaching is that you got the same jersey on. Man, how, how in the world are we not taking care of each other and loving on each other and Man, man, respect and, and help the assembly. We're in this together. So, so kind of a cool idea here is if we're going to really run together, there's, there's the word I just want you to, if you're taking notes, just write down the word alignment. Because I really believe that alignment is what creates or makes possible your assignment. And in a pretty basic sports analogy, I think the reality is for you, it would be impossible to actually fulfill your assignment if you weren't aligned correctly. If my job, J-Dubs, you want to stand up just real quick? Looking all fit, representing palm tree, okay? J-Dubs over there, if my job is to block J-Dubs at the snap of the ball, I'm not aligned correctly to actually do that assignment. I'm too far away. But if, if, if what I've been asked to do, if my assignment it's to get in here, get my hands on them at the snap of the ball, and now I'm in a better spot I can actually get there. But it, would be, it wouldn't matter how athletic a guy is. It wouldn't matter how much pro potential they have. It would be impossible to fulfill that assignment if I wasn't aligned correctly. 
It's impossible for a, a beam in a building to hold up what it's supposed to support if it's not in the proper position to support. So alignment is critical for our assignments. And so I, I want to throw out there today, there's a couple things that I want to just quickly just talk about. Is this aligned in your life? Obviously, your family. Man, is your family aligned? Is, it, is, it, is, the, is this with God and then this with your family? Is it right? Because, man, what we've been taught and what we've experienced is if we're aligned as a couple, man, bring on the rest of the world. It's all good. We got this. Man, we're right with God. We're right with each other. We got the right people around us. Bring it. Because we can last. That makes us sustainable. So I just throw out there your family. And, and, and a couple questions just to ask yourself about your family. What's the communication like in your house? And is there trust? And we could, we could dive into that a little bit. I'm going to keep moving. But, but just ask those questions. What's the communication like? Maybe you do need to have a weekly family meeting. Maybe it would help to remove anxiety if everybody knew what was going on. And you could, you could forecast for it and plan for it and be excited about it. What's the communication like? And is there trust? And then the second one is just what you don't always get to choose your family, but the second one you get to choose the people you surround yourself with. Man, are they helping? And, and a question that's pretty basic but pretty effective, at the beginning of every year, Molly and I make a list, and it's okay, who are we going to reach up to, reach out to, and reach down to? And are those in place so that we can grow and we can help other people? Is it in place? That's how we surround ourselves personally. And then the last one is just with your job, with what you do, especially if you've got any kind of leadership position at that job. Man, are you stewarding what God's given you, and are the people that you're over, are they in their lanes, are they in their strengths? If we can get those things lined up correctly, we're going to fly, and we can actually do what God's called us to do. I'll tell you this, my sophomore year of college, I was questioning the assignment part of it. Got my life right with God, it was going pretty good, was in college, and could not figure out what the next step was. And I met Pastor Bill. Whole funny story. He had a pretty amazing, what I think, little, little plan. We met, and he goes, man, I'll tell you what, you come to the church. I'll tell you the call of God that's on your life. And I thought, that is a slick move. I really want to know the plan. And I said something stupid like, oh, but I can figure it out. So he goes, well, how about lunch? I was like, yeah, got me. He like, that was it, that was it. We went over to the BBD2, and I've been coming to this church for 19 years because I got invited to lunch. But I'm telling you what happened is I got my alignment correct and it made the, the assignment a lot more obvious. And not even immediately. Because I think so many of us are looking for this like passion button. And if I can discover my passion, then I'll commit forever. And it's completely opposite. If we'll choose to commit, our, our passion will be identified. But we got to commit first. I did not want to do youth ministry. It didn't make sense. I just got out of that. Why would I go back to that? I was so stupid in high school. Why would I be around that? And it was just a, a fun opportunity that was presented. And I'm telling you, I give so much credit to our pastors for identifying abilities, skills, traits, whatever. Because it's hard to walk by a young person today and not make sure they're going to heaven because it identified a passion that I did not know was there. But it was a result of committing, and it led to the passion. Let me jump into the point, the third point here. Who's following? Who's watching? Who's running? And then who's following? And I want to read you a little something out of Mark. It's, it's kind of one of these epic moments in the Bible. It's, it's right at this point. It's getting crazy for Jesus. And in Mark 15, in, in verse 16, this is kind of the Amplified. It gives some cool details. But it says, the soldiers led him away into the palace and they called together the entire Roman battalion, which would be about 600 soldiers. They dressed Jesus up in a ranking Roman officer's robe of purple. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they placed it on him and they began saluting and mocking him. Hail, King of the Jews. They kept beating him on the head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing and mock homage to him. After they mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his clothes and they led him out of the city to crucify him. 
It's one of the most significant moments in the history of the world. And then verse 21 happens. They forced into service a passerby coming in from the countryside, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. I've read this passage a number of times, but a couple years ago I read that verse and I was reading in the Jimmy Swaggart Study Bible. And right underneath it, it said, this is, the, this is the same Alexander and Rufus referred to in Romans as great men of God. And it got me then, and I'm telling you, it, it gets me today. Because due to the beatings that Jesus was suffering, he was physically incapable of carrying the cross any further. And they grab what I pictured to be this, this big fella. It's from Libya, which is an African country, this, this big old boy. And he gets up underneath that cross, and he starts carrying it for Jesus. And he's got two little boys watching him do it. And I just think about the lives that we get to live. It's an amazing life. And what people are counting on, the people that are watching, is they want to watch what it looks like for somebody to carry the cross. And I can only imagine that scene because they're whipping Jesus and they're spitting on Jesus. And then their dad gets right in the middle of that and picks up the cross. So now he's getting spit on. And now he's getting whipped. And these two boys are watching it. And what we know is as a result of them seeing their dad do that, they get referred to as great men, missionaries and followers of Christ. They saw their dad do it. It changed the course of their life, and they live for Jesus every day after. So I put that on the table tonight. Man, who's watching you? Are you running? Who are you running with? And then who's following? Great verse in 1 Corinthians. It just says, man, I, I follow me as I follow Christ. If, if you'll be confident enough to follow me, I will lead you to the source. I will lead you to the Savior. And man, just like Simon, I, we just have to ask ourselves the question today, are you willing to pick up your cross? Because I'm just telling you, based on this and, and just what we've seen, we've watched our pastor carry his cross. You've, you've seen people that have actually carried the cross. But it's just laying our lives down. And if we'll do it, if we'll decide to get dirty enough to get down and pick up the cross, people will get in line because they're going to follow somebody that knows where they're going. And we have this unbelievable opportunity in a church like this to reach people. And in a country like this that makes it free for us to, to kind of get outside ourselves a little bit, to zoom out just a little bit. And just to ask the question, who's following? Who's watching? Men, are you running? It's an unbelievable opportunity. And I'm just telling you, if we'll do that, from right here, from the life you're currently living, if we'll do that, we really can't change the world from here. But there's people counting on you, specifically you, to do what God's called you to do. What's that look like for you? What do we need to edit? What do we need to add? What do we need to change about what's currently happening in your life to do exactly what you know you're supposed to be doing?